All right, good morning. Welcome back to Pathagonia. Uh, so we're going to continue with our central nervous system tumors section from Kurt's notes. Uh, yesterday for part one, we went through gliomas and just some general guidelines, um, some location of where common tumors are located. And then we made our way into the astrocytic tumors section, which I decided to just take a pause and then pick it back up today just to try to keep these uh, episodes or parts um, between 30 and 60 minutes. So right now we're in the astrocytic tumor section still, and we're just gonna keep working our way through. So this section is called new molecular grading changes. So for diffuse astrocytic glioma, IDH wild type, with molecular features of glioblastoma or who grade four, Genetic changes that indicate an IDH wild type astrocytoma will behave aggressively and should be graded as glioblastoma grade 4, even if traditional morphologic findings of glioblastoma aren't present. So, 1. EGFR amplification, or 2. Combined whole chromosome 7 gain, or whole chromosome 10 loss, so gain of 7, loss of 10, or Turk promoter mutation. So even if you lack the traditional morphologic findings of a glioblastoma, if it's IDH wild type, um, it's going to be a, graded as a glioblastoma grade four. So astrocytoma, IDH mutant, who grade four? Given that IDH mutant glioblastomas have a better prognosis than IDH wild type glioblastomas, there's a shift to now classify them as grade 4 astrocytomas instead. So for IDH mutant tumors, CDKN2A or B homozygous deletion can also count similar to necrosis and microvascular proliferation for upgrading. Um, so. Just real quickly, I'll go over these tables. So table six, suggested definitions and grading of astrocytomas, IDH mutant. So astrocytoma, IDH mutant, who grade two, is a diffusely infiltrative astrocytic glioma with an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation that is well differentiated and lacks histologic features of anaplasia. Uh, mitotic activity is not detected or low and microvascular proliferation, necrosis, and CDKN2A or B homozygous deletions are absent. And then the mitotic round, mitotic activity or count, and the um, presence or absence of the CDKN2A or B um, are going to vary moving onward into the grade three and grade four. And then suggested criteria for glioblastoma IDH wild type, an IDH wild type diffuse astrocytic glioma with microvascular proliferation or necrosis, or one or more of the following molecular features of glioblastoma, um, TERP promoter mutation or EGFR gene amplification, or gain of seven, loss of 10 chromosome copy number changes. Next category, we've got diffuse glioma, H3.3, G34 mutant, who grade four. So this is a diffuse glioma of the cerebral hemispheres with a missense mutation, exchanging glycine for arginine or valine at position 34 of the mature histone H3.3 protein, which is why you get the name H3.3, G34 mutant. And this is IDH wild type, so diffuse glioma H3.3 G34 mutant commonly occurs in the pediatric and young adult pop pa patients or populations and in the cerebral hemispheres. It has diffusely infiltrating atypical astrocytes with features of anaplasia, including mitotic activity, microvascular proliferation and or necrosis. And sometimes it may resemble an embryonal tumor with a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So the molecular, or IHC, uh, it's gonna be positive for H3.3 G34 mutant specific IHC. P53 overexpression, loss of ATRX, and negative 
IDH or OLEG2. And this typically has a poor prognosis. So moving on, we've got diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M mutant, which is WHO grade four. The older name was diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, or DIPG. This is an infiltrative high-grade midline glioma with predominantly astrocytic differentiation and a K27M mutation in the histone coding genes H3F3A, or HIST1H3B slash C. So the diffuse midline glioma H3K27M mutant predominates in children but can be seen in adults. Common locations include the brainstem or pons, the thalamus, and the spinal cord. Tumor cells are usually small and monomorphic, and sometimes can be pleomorphic, and diffusely infiltrates adjacent and distant brain structures. The mitotic activity is often present, and then necrosis and microvascular proliferation may be present, but are not necessary for diagnosis. Then on IHC, diffuse midline gliomas are going to be positive for S100, OLIG2, plus minus for GFAP, um, and MAP2, and then positive for mutation-specific antibody for H3K27M. And these typically have a poor prognosis of less than two years. And this is what diffuse midline glioma may look like. Next up, we've got a SEGA, or subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. We have the SEGA logo here for you gamers out there. Um, this is WHO grade 1, um, it's benign, slow-growing tumor, uh, well-circumscribed, often with calcifications, composed of large, plump, gemistocytic astrocytes with abundant pink, glassy cytoplasm. Uh, it's arranged in fascicles, sheets, and nests with some areas that may have smaller spindled cells. Uh, frequently, there's giant ganglion-like cells with prominent nucleoli, which is what we see here. Considerable, there's usually considerable nuclear pleomorphism, and segas typically arise in the wall of the lateral ventricles. Um, usually present before age 20, often presenting with seizures, and there's a very song, strong association with tuberous sclerosis. So if you have a question stem, or in real life, if your patient has tuberous sclerosis and they present with a lesion, um, that could be in the wall of the lateral ventricles. Definitely want to think of a SEGA. And it has a good prognosis with total resection. Next up, we've got pilocytic astrocytoma, or PA. So this is a WHO grade 1 lesion. It's an astrocytoma with a biphasic pattern with varying proportions of compact bipolar cells with Rosenthal fibers, which is what we see over here these eosinophilic uh, rod-shaped fibers, Rosenthal fibers, and has loose textured multipolar cells with microcysts and eosinophilic granular bodies. The nuclei typically elongate and relatively bland. They may be round or like that of an oligo. Um, Still allowed, you can have rare mitoses, hyperchromatic pleomorphic nuclei, microvascular proliferation, necrosis, and infiltration of the meninges, and still be a pilocytic astrocytoma. It's the most common glioma in children and adolescents. Uh, preferentially, it's infratentorial, located in the cerebellum and cerebral midline structures, uh, such as the optic pathways like a, or the brainstem, and they often present with neurologic deficits. Um, here is a picture of those eosinophilic granular bodies we alluded to. Uh, they're more circular, whereas the Rosenthal fibers are a little bit more elongated, such as what we see here in this image. This is on a, actually on a smear. And then you have eosinophilic granular bodies, which as the name would suggest, they're more granular, concentric. Rosenthal fibers are more elongated. Uh, Pilocytic astrocytomas are generally circumscribed and slow-growing. They're sometimes cystic, with mutations in the MAP kinase pathway, most commonly BRAF fusion proteins. Um, they're slow-growing, low-grade with a favorable prognosis, and they can be cured with surgical excision if possible. 
Here's a variant of pilomyxoid astrocytoma. So it's a variant with angiocentric arrangement of monomorphous bipolar cells and a prominent myxoid background. Uh, may grow more rapidly and have a worse prognosis and it's not currently graded. Moving right along, we've got pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma or PXA, who grade two. So this is astrocytic tumor with large pleomorphic and frequently multinucleated spindled and lipidized cells. There's frequent intranuclear inclusions and prominent nucleoli with a dense reticulin network, um, numerous eosinophilic granular bodies and often neuronal differentiation with low mitotic activity, so less than five mites per 10 high powered fields. For IHC and molecular, for a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, frequently it's going to have a BRAF V600E mutation, uh, no IDH mutations, and majority have a combination of BRAF V600E and CDKN2A or B homozygous deletion. Uh, positive for GFAP and S100, uh, plus minus on the neuronal markers, like MAP2, CD34, and the key 67 is generally less than 1%. So low mitotic activity, low key 67 expression. PXAs are relatively rare, uh, most common in children and young adults, often superficially located in the cerebral hemispheres, especially the temporal lobe with involvement of the leptomeninges, and there's a good prognosis with long-term survival. So PXA, as the name suggests, pleomorphic, Xanthoastrocytoma, if we just look at this image, um, pleomorphism is certainly one of the things that stands out at first to me. Very, a lot of variation in size and shape of these cells. And then the xantho aspect that looks like to be like a xanthomatous component in the background, um, at least to my untrained eye. So you can, you can see where the name pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma would derive from. And that was who grade two. So similar entity, but slightly higher grade is an anaplastic pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, which is who grade three. Uh, it's the same as the above, but there's five or more mitoses per 10 high powered fields. You may have necrosis, but it's not necessary for the diagnosis. Um, and there's a lower frequency of BRAF V600E mutation. Uh, this has a significantly worse prognosis than a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, but still better than many high-grade gliomas. And again, that would make sense that the prognosis would be worse if you're seeing a higher mitotic count indicating that the tumor is uh, dividing or replicating at a higher rate than uh, the lower-grade entity. And here are some examples of various mitoses. You have a ring mitoses and uh, pretty pr um, prominent mitotic figures. All right, we made it to our next category, and that is oligodendrocyte tumors. So these are diffusely infiltrating gliomas morphologically resembling oligodendrocytes. And we have our picture here of a fried egg, which at least for me when I was studying for step one and in medical school when I was first introduced to some of these uh, brain tumors, I think it was probably when I was going through pathoma for the first time, this allusion to fried eggs often came up with oligodendrogliomas. And if you look at the image real quick, you can see why, right? We have our yolk in the middle, or uh, yeah, we have our egg, our fried egg, and it looks quite similar to this image here. All right, next up, we've got defining genetics for oligodendrocytes, we have IDH1 or IDH2 mutations and 1P19Q code deletions. So this is an unbalanced translocation between chromosomes 1 and 19, resulting in, in loss of the DER119 chromosome, causing code deletion of whole arms of 1P and 19Q. Uh, it's acceptable if some cells show astrocytic differentiation if these genetic changes are present. Um, and you can have IDH1, R132H mutations present in more than 90%, which can be detected by IHC. 
and 1P19Q co-deletions are usually identified by fish. Frequently, there's TERP promoter mutations. Unlike in astrocytomas, there is no ATRX loss or P53 mutations. And there's usually occur in adult patients in the cerebral hemisphere, such as the frontal lobe. They rarely occur in children. And like many brain entities, they present often with seizures. So oligodendrocyte tumors are gonna stain with MAP2, S100, SOX10, OLIG2 and usually positive for IDH1, R132H, with intact ATRX and wild-type P53. So oligodendroglioma, who grade 2? We've got those fried eggs. It's going to be moderately cellular, diffusely infiltrating, with monomorphic round nuclei, with artificial perinuclear halos, uh, or fried egg or honeycomb appearance only seen in formalin fixed sections and you can sometimes have salt and pepper chromatin. Uh, microcalcifications and cystic degener degeneration are common and a delicate branching capillary network may also be seen with low mitotic activity and rare mitoses acceptable. Key 67 proliferation index is usually less than 5% and prolonged survival can be more than 11 years. These generally recur with malignant progression common, but much slower than astrocytomas. And that delicate branching capillary network or chicken wire, chicken wire vasculature kind of reminds me of clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Um, even the cleared out areas reminds me of it as well. So uh, just another thing to be mindful of, of various buzzwords or patterns that we can just help build our differential diagnosis with. So an anaplastic oligodendroglioma or WHO grade 3 is going to be similar to a, the classic oligodendroglioma but with focal or diffuse histologic features of anaplasia. Usually shows multiple um, of these features such as brisk mitotic activity. We see mitoses here microvascular proliferation, which is shown here, or spontaneous necrosis. And it's kind of a theme that we're picking up with so far, right? We're only in part two of this document that we're going through, but more mites, more microvascular proliferation and necrosis is gonna make these higher grade commonly with these brain entities and um, often worse prognosis. Although some of these findings are also seen in GBMs, as long as the defining genetic alterations are present, you can still make the diagnosis of anaplastic oligodendroglioma. You can sometimes see marked atypia with a key 67 expression over 5%. Um, and progression from grade two to grade three typically takes about six years. So if patients often slightly older or middle-aged and they have a shorter survival once they're at grade three of about three and a half years. All right, our next category is ependymal tumors. And first up, we've got ependymoma, which is who grade two or three. And this is a circumscribed glioma composed of uniform small cells with round nuclei and speckled chromatin in a fibrillary matrix. There's characteristically pseudo rosettes which is what we're seeing here, which is perivascular anucleate zones found in practically every case of ependymoma. You're going to see these pseudo rosettes. Um, true ependymal rosettes or bland cuboidal cells arranged around a central lumen are found in about one third of cases. So if the center of the rosette is a vessel, it's a pseudo rosette. If it's around a central lumen, it's a true rosette which are seen in about a third of cases, but pseudo-rosettes, so this anucleate clearing around a vessel is seen in most cases, practically every case. There's variable cellularity of ependymomas, and they can hyalinize or have canals. Oh, and real quick, here's an example of a true rosette. So we've got this clearing around a central lumen. That's a true rosette, whereas pseudo-rosettes are around vessels. The pendymomas are mainly intracranial. You can get them in the spinal cord, 
and they can occur in both children and adults. So in children, they're usually posterior fossa, often the fourth ventricle, with generally low cell density and mitotic index. And electron microscopy shows cilia and microvilli. On IHC, they're gonna stain with EMA along the lumina surface of rosettes or dot-like perinuclear staining. And they're gonna stain with GFAP in the pseudo rosettes and S100. And ependymomas have variable outcome depending on resection therapy and the molecular group. So the current recommendation is to classify based on location and molecular changes. If there are no molecular changes, say not elsewhere classified. And if you can't do molecular testing, say not otherwise specified. You can grade as two or three morphologically. Default is two and brisk mitotic activity and dense cellularity is a grade three. So there are morphologic subtypes of ependymomas, such as tansitic, clear cell, papillary, but they do not impact prognosis, and subependymoma and mixopapillary ependymoma are identified morphologically as well. So there are unique molecular subgroups by location, uh, supratentorial, posterior fossa, and spinal cord are all um, defined by a different molecular subgroup and with a corresponding prognosis and various IHC patterns, which I will let you reference. Rather than uh, just reading this table to you, I'll let you refer back to it. So for a sub ependymoma, who grade one, this is a slow-growing exophytic and intraventricular lesion with clusters of mostly bland cells embedded in abundant fibrillary matrix. There's no significant mitotic activity, but you have frequent microcystic change. Um, sometimes they can calcify, as we see here, with rare pseudo-rosettes. They're often detected incidentally and often are asymptomatic, um, all ages can have a subependymoma who grade one with sharply demarcated grossly. On IHC, it's gonna stain for GFAP, negative for EMA, and the key 67 is less than 1%. So subependymomas have an excellent prognosis, a low grade, low proliferation rate. Moving on, this is a pretty cool entity, um, mixopapillary ependymoma, who grade two, this arises almost exclusive, exclusively in the region of the conus medullaris, cauda equina, and felum terminale. It's elongated to cuboidal cells arranged in radial patterns around vascularized mucoid fibrovascular cores, which is what we're seeing here. And if you kind of just look at these images, you could see where mixopapillary is going to come from, right? So papillary fibrovascular cores, Mixo, we kind of have this mucoid, mixoid material, and ependymoma still has that ependymal appearance as well. These are slow growing, typically occurring in young adults, and they're going to stain with mucin, is highlighted by alcyon blue, positive for GFAP, S100, CD99, CK, CKAE1, AE3, or the cytokeratin markers and mixopapillary ependymomas are thought to have a favorable prognosis, but sometimes they're hard to resect with recurrences. And it was previously who grade one, but currently data suggests it's actually who grade two, but still thought to have a favorable prognosis. So this is one of those entities that location, 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 like in real estate, um, if you have a question or, and more importantly, a patient in real life, um, with the lesion in the cauda equina or felum terminale or the region of the conus medullaris. Um, you could definitely want to start thinking about mixopapillary ependymoma on your differential. <clears throat> so next up we have anaplastic ependymoma or who grade three and you're kind of seeing a trend here again right so you have these various entities and then once you put anaplastic in front of it it bumps it up to a who grade three or a little bit higher grade, a little bit worse prognosis. So this was a category in the 2016 who, but will no longer be with the next edition as the who grade doesn't seem to significantly impact prognosis in ependymomas. 
Um, it's defined by high cell density and elevated mitotic count, and it also may see widespread microvascular proliferation and necrosis. So some other gliomas, you can have a choroid glioma of the third ventricle, which is who grade two, slow growing non-invasive glial tumor, which is very rare, located in the third ventricle and can lead to obstructive hydrocephalus. You can also have clusters and cords of epithelioid tumor cells within variably mucinous stroma, which typically has associated lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. On IHC, these choroid gliomas are gonna be positive for GFAP, strongly and diffusely, TTF1, CD34, plus minus S100, and cytokeratins, uh, usually occurring in adults and a good prognosis if resected. Andri angiocentric glioma is who grade one, stable or slow growing and well circumscribed, primarily impacting children and young adults, presenting with epilepsy, and on the superficial cerebrocortical location. As the name suggested, it has an angiocentric growth pattern with monomorphous bipolar cells oriented around cortical blood vessels. It can resemble pseudo rosettes of ependymomas um, with other areas resembling schwannoma with fibrillary areas. And then on IHC, it's gonna be positive for GFAP and EMA like an ependymoma. And then molecular is going to have a MIB fusion, usually MIB QKI. And angiocentric gliomas have an excellent prognosis and are usually curable with excision. All right, next up we've got astroblastoma. This is rare, uh, mainly occur occurring in children and adolescents. It's going to be well demarcated within the cerebral hemispheres and cells with broad processes radiating towards the central blood vessels or known as astroblastic pseudo rosettes. There's going to be frequent vascular hyalinization and they're going to stain for GFAP and S100, commonly with MN1 alterations. And the biologic behavior varies and is not currently graded. All right, so we're approaching 30 minutes. I think I might try to do one or two more sections, um, but I'm not gonna go all the way through the document today, just so we can kind of break it up and make it a little bit more digestible because there's so much material to review. So our next category is the choroid plexus tumors. So these are derived from the choroid plexus epithelium, which is found in the ventricles. And for IHC, they're gonna be positive for KIR7.1, uh, CK, AE1, AE3, Vimentin, CK7, plus or minus for S100 and negative for EMA. So big picture, I think of like choroid plexus entities on a spectrum from papilloma to atypical papilloma to carcinoma or choroid plexus carcinoma. Papilloma obviously being on the lower end, lower mitotic rate, lower grade, and carcinoma being the worst um, as far as mitotic rate and prognosis. So choroid plexus papilloma, who grade one? It's a benign ventricular papillary neoplasm, most common in the lateral ventricle and about two thirds of choroid plexus tumors. So all ages can have this, but it's more commonly occurring in kids, and it can present with hydrocephalus. There's a delicate fibrovascular fronds covered by a single layer of cuboidal to columnar epithelium with round to oval basal monomorphic nuclei. And there's very low or absent mitotic activity, less than two per 10 high powered fields, and key 67 is usually less than 2%. Patient, patients usually cured by surgical resection. Moving on to uh, along the spectrum, the choroid plexus entities. So a choroid plexus papilloma is who grade two. Atypical choroid plexus papilloma, sorry, is who grade two. And that's a choroid plexus papilloma that has increased mites. So more than two mites per 10 high powered fields 
Still has that papillary choroid appearance, but does not fulfill the criteria of choroid plexus carcinoma. These are often present but not required, um, which is increased cellularity, nuclear pleomorphism, solid growth and necrosis, and more likely to recur, but still have relatively good prognosis. And moving on, we have choroid plexus carcinoma, which is WHO grade three, and these are frankly malignant epithelial neoplasms. And if we just look at the picture quickly, we can tell this looks a lot worse than what we were seeing with the choroid plexus papilloma or the atypical choroid plexus papilloma. This to my eye, at first glance, makes me think of like an encapsulated carcinoma of the breast or something like that. It looks a lot busier, a lot worse, um, a lot less benign. It's most commonly in the lateral ventricles of children and has at least four of the following, um, which is frequent mitoses, so more than five per 10 high-powered fields, unlike the atypical choroid plexus papilloma, which has more than two mites per 10 high-powered fields. So if you have more than five, you're in that carcinoma category. Increased cell density, nuclear pleomorphism, blurring of the papillary pattern with poorly formed sheets of tumor cells and necrosis. Um, this frequently invades the neighboring brain and metastasizes via the CSF, and the key 67 is often over 10%, and about half have TP53 mutations, with, and this entity has an intermediate prognosis and survival.